Hello, everyone. Um, as Rob mentioned, my name is Maya Dalton, also as um, shown in the giant M to my left. Um, I'm a second year graduate student at Penn State University. Our paper is titled Measuring Changes in Corruption Over Time um, with my co-author, Justin Esri. Um, we appreciate any and all feedback on the project itself, and we are also looking to submit to journals in the near future, so any feedback on um, those journals would also be amazing. So let's get into it. So our broad research question, can we employ existing measures of corruption to study its causes and effects using international panel data? Before we kind of poke at this research question, I wanna first get into what are these measures of corruption? So the first one, um, Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index. This may be familiar to some of you, but this measure is constructed by averaging about three to 13 different corruption scores taken from perception-based surveys and expert-led assessments. Um, this measure measures perception of corruption and not necessarily reported cases, detentions, or um, proven acts of corruption. However, in um, recent years, it has become highly criticized, especially centered around its methodology. Our second measure of corruption is the World Bank Group's um, Worldwide Governance Indicators. So the WBGI uses a measurement model, specifically an um, unobserved components model, or UCM, which assumes that the observed data from each source are a linear function of the unobserved level of governance in an error term. And these six uh, indicators of governance include control of corruption, which is what we focus on, um, voice and accountability, rule of law, government effectiveness, political stability, and regulatory quality. Like the CPI, it also measures perceptions of corruption um, from surveys and experts. Some criticisms around this is that it does have large standard errors and also, it has been found that the six indicators are not empirically distinct, meaning that they all kind of measure the same thing, which isn't great. Our third measure of corruption, the Bayesian Corruption Index, or the BCI, actually builds upon the previous two corruption measures. Um, using um, the specifically the WBGI measurement model, the BCI implements a state space model, um, which allows for temporal flexibility, giving us a longer range of corruption scores and also allows a country's level of corruption to change more rapidly over time. This also measures the persistence of corruption using those perception-based surveys and expert assessments. Next, we have the Political Risk Services International Country Risk Guide. That's kind of a mouthful, the ICRG for short. The ICRG is a little bit different in that it aims to assess how much corruption um, within the political system can threaten um, foreign investment in the stability of the regime. So it specifically collects expert assessment of political risk. It's calculated by taking points and weights assigned by all of these different dimensions, filtering that into political risk. One of those dimensions is corruption. So the ICRG includes corruption and a few other things to um, assess the risk to foreign investors in a country. Finally, we have the varieties of democracy or the VDEM um, corruption measure, which is collected via expert-led um, item response theory modeling techniques to estimate how well, gover how well governments um, respond to democratic ideals. So this includes sub-indicators of corruption in the public, executive, legislative, and judicial sectors. So all of these measures include expert-led assessments, um, but some are combined with measurement models, some are combined with um, perception-based surveys of the community within a country. So to show these measures in action a little bit and potentially probe at our research question, we illustrate two examples. So first we look at the changes in corruption within China and within the United States over time. While um, the measurements clearly share, clearly share commonalities, there are some big differences. So for example, if we look at China, and specifically looking at the ICRG, which is the dashed and dotted line um, for those on Zoom, between about 2005 to 2018, the ICRG is relatively stable, um, but all of the other measures indicate a sharp decline in corruption during that time period. Then if we go to look at the United States, 
looking at the BCI, for example, which is this thicker um, dashed line, it has a slight decrease and then goes up a little bit um, around the Obama administration and then back down. However, um, during the Obama administration, a lot of the other measures are either relatively stable or um, go along with an increase. Then we kind of see some mixed um, results around when um, the Trump administration takes over, whether it's decreasing corruption, stability, or increasing. So because of this disagreement with measures, it becomes difficult to answer basic descriptive questions, which is a little bit concerning. So for another example, um, we estimate a pretty simple time series model of corruption data in the United States asking, was the Obama administration more or less corrupt than any other presidential administration from 19 80 to 2020. And we present this pretty simple model here where our um, dependent variable is US corruption score at time t, and we include a dummy variable for um, during the Obama administration. As a robustness check, we present results from a model where corruption is also first differenced to consider the potential non-stationarity of the panel data to avoid spurious correlation. So here are the results from this model. On the left, we have just the general levels of corruption and then the first difference. The left, um, we have our coefficient, 95% confidence intervals for during the Obama administration from that equation one. Um, each of the colors represents the five corruption measures um, as shown on the x-axis. And the right panel shows the same thing with that first difference corruption score. So a little bit disturbingly, when studying levels of corruption, like in the left panel, the five measurements give very different answers. If we um, interpret the statistically significant results as null findings, then we find that three of the scores show no difference. One of them shows the Obama administration as being more corrupt, and then another shows the Obama administration as being less corrupt. So that's a little concerning. Why do we see these results? We know that corruption is deliberately hidden from view. And therefore, the measures of corruption are, tend to be indirect. That's why we have the perception-based measures of the experts coming in and doing their assessments and that kind of stuff. Most of these measures indicate in their methodology reports that these indicators can be used for measuring changes um, within country changes in corruption over time. However, we see that that's not necessarily the case in those two examples. And the issues with measuring corruption, like I mentioned, are not unknown. All of these measures have potential flaws such as different definitions of corruption. We saw that the ICRG um, conceptualizes corruption a different way. There may be bias um, between the perception-based surveys and the expert-led assessments. There could be weak methodological foundations, um, such as the um, TICPI before 2012. There could be anti-corruption efforts going on at the same time that are changing how we perceive corruption in a country in a given year. And then there's also the um, difficulty with comparing these scores across time, as we just saw. So what's the solution? The argument that allows researchers to sleep soundly at night typically is construct validity. By construct validity, we mean that a measure is related to other measures that our theoretical understanding of a concept requires them to be. So high construct validity means that corruptions, corruption measures are clearly correlated and then all measures measure the same contract, which is in this case, corruption. So as shown in this graph, all of the corruption measures are highly correlated at about a range of like 0.7 to 0.9, which is good news, right? That's what we wanna see. But what about changes in corruption over time within a country like we just saw? Many research designs are reliant on the validity of within country changes um, within country changes over time and need these measures to be accurate. For example, difference in difference designs compares changes in corruption in a treated country versus an untreated country over a certain period of time to give us an average treatment effect um, on corruption levels. Another example is a two-stage least squares um, design, a two SLS design, which typically uses lagged corruption as an instrumental variable. So all of the variation in that design is within country. Accurate measures mean that we can extract the true causal effects from these designs 
Um, and for these designs to work, the within country changes need to be valid. The bad news is that most of the correlation between the measures of corruption is driven by between country variation. So what do we do? Our approach is similar to that of the WBGI and the BCI in that we propose a new measurement model to recover more um, accurate corruption indicators. Um, so first, we create a panel-adjusted corruption score where we extract that between-country variation that drives the correlation between measures, as well as the year-specific fixed effects. Um, then we're left with only the within-country changes. To show a similar graph, where we have these panel-adjusted measures of corruption, we see that the correlation completely falls apart, meaning that any study reliant on the validity of within-country measures of corruption may also fall apart. So what does this measurement model include? So we propose a relatively simple model um, for the latent concept of corruption that will give us a methodology to decide whether these five measures of corruption map into a similar concept. So we use a principal components analysis. We define this model with um, K equals five panel adjusted measures, the five measures we've been talking about. And it showed in equation three, omega is the measure that we're, uh, the concept that we're looking for. And omega is a linear combination of this unobserved corruption level, psi, and some error terms, nu. What PCA does is it gives us this um, vector delta to maximize the variance of psi. And assuming that each panel adjusted measure is a composite of latent corruption scores, if we know the values of delta, omega, and nu, we can recover psi. So we perform a PCA analysis on the raw corruption measures, as well as our panel adjusted measures. Um, and some expectations are, if these measures all target the same concept, we um, expect to see them load strongly onto the same dimension. However, if they do not load onto the same dimension or one dimension explains more variation than another, these measures may target different notions of corruption, include concepts other than corruption, or just be maybe contaminated by measurement error. Before we get into the results of the PCA, however, we want to verify that our methodology can give us what we actually need, the within country changes in latent corruption using biased and noisy measures. So we simulate the process with known parameters. I know there's a lot of Greek up here, but I will try and break it down into bite-sized chunks. So for each country I, there's a true latent corruption concept psi. That is the sum of the average corruption score in that country plus the trend in corruption um, scores tau times the time period. So that's our corruption, latent corruption value. Then um, this creates six observable measures, which is this big long equation here, M. So that creates our simulated measures. And in that measure, it includes a latent bias um, variable called lambda. So this lambda represents the possibility that people in the institutions that make these measures may make bias assessments using factors such as institutional history, um, stereotypes for the culture in that country, or just different definitions of corruption. So that lambda includes any of that bias. So it's also important to note that we include this um, bias variable because while corruption scores and bias trend over time, bias trends a lot more strongly. So we simulate this data generation process 10,000 times for 100 countries in 10 time periods to get about 10,000 simulated data sets. We then construct the panel corrected um, corruption scores in the data and also create a PCA based measure and compare the correlations between those. So we examine the correlation between corruption and raw simulated measures, which is up here at the top, um, panel corrected simulated measures, and the PCA scores, which are the middle ones. So what these results tell us is that within country corruption is only weakly correlated with the raw measures of corruption before we do any panel adjustment. However, when we look at the PCA and the panel corrected, um, correlations, these jump up a little bit higher to about 0 0.6, 0 0.8 correlation. Finally, just as among the actual measures of corruption that we saw back in that blue 
grid um, correlation plot, we have a higher correlation between the raw measures of corruption and the true corruption scores that include both between and within country variation. So now we can turn to the results of our PCA analysis, looking at actual corruption measures taken from our country year data, which includes 199 countries from 1980 to 2020. So this table shows the factor loadings for the raw corruption scores and the panel adjusted scores. And then within those, we have two dimensions each, PC1 and PC2. Both the raw and within corruption, uh, the raw and panel adjusted corruption measures map pretty similar, similarly onto this PC1 dimension, which we um, assume is the concept of corruption. However, in the raw scores, we see that the, um, the R squared value here is a lot higher for the raw scores than the panel adjusted scores, meaning that 90% of the variance in the raw scores is accounted for by this first dimension, whereas only 39.5% of the variance in the panel adjusted scores is accounted for by this first dimension. Even more concerning is that in the panel adjusted scores, we also have, let me switch it back. Yeah, you're good. Um, in the panel adjusted scores, we also have the second dimension um, that suggests that there's some other unidentified common factor that covers 21.8% of the variance in our corruption measures. So these findings do suggest that corruption measures track a common component um, of changing corruption within a country over time, but with a lot less accuracy than they do for between country variation. So to kind of wrap things up, changes in corruption within a country over time are not well correlated between different measures of corruption. We saw that um, in the, again, the big blue and green grid plots with the correlations, but also um, results in studies might be a lot more sensitive to the choice of the measure chosen for um, the study as we saw in these China and United States examples. However, the good news is, is that it is possible for researchers to extract a common factor um, from the multiple corruption measures and run a PCA similar to we did using the panel adjusted measures and then use those resulting scores to accurately recover changes in corruption within a country over time. And what we hope is that future research could begin to unravel that second dimension from the panel adjusted scores to kind of shed some light on a new theoretical understanding of what we're actually capturing when we measure corruption. So that wraps up things um, for the talk portion. We have some references and then our um, emails on the slides. So we're gonna go ahead and move into Q&A. Um, so yeah, if anyone has questions, feedback, I'm more than happy to hear it. So thank you. <laughs> Can I say that again? Oh, okay, so we're gonna take our own questions. Oh, okay. Um, Maya, do you wanna take the lead on that? And yeah. um, we'll- I can't see the Zoom though to see the, the Q and A chats though. So. Uh, let me see if I can do that. Yeah, and I'm gonna pull up something to write with just in case. Uh, okay, it looks like we don't have any questions on Zoom yet. So okay. uh, while we're waiting, um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, May will acknowledge you and uh, we'll do our best to answer your question. <clears throat> hmm? I'll repeat it back. Okay, go ahead. So, um, so one of the things that you pointed to was that the uh, panel data adjusted were not doing a very good job of, correct me if I'm wrong here, not doing a very good job of cross national comparison. Mm -hmm. I can, yeah, I, I, um, sorry, I 
turn it off so that I can, uh, I'll repeat the question. So the, the question is basically, is it the case that uh, maybe um, the measures within country are coarse? So they don't do a great job of nailing down year to year variation precisely when it happens, but perhaps if you were to average over, you know, a five year period or a 10 year period, it would do a better job. Uh, the answer to your question is no, they don't. We have done an analysis, uh, it's in the appendix, because uh, this, well, the paper, we thought it was gonna be a note, so we were trying to keep everything short, and now it's grown into a full paper, so probably we'll just go ahead and put this back in. But um, when we use a, even decade average um, scores, so you get basically four time periods in, in our data set, yeah, wait, more than that, 80, 80 to 90, 90 to 2000, uh, 2020, 2010, yeah, four time periods, 2010, 2020. The correlations within within that sort of decade average panel is still terrible. It's, it's a little higher than it, w it is uh, annually, but not anywhere near as high as the, the raw scores that have between and within country. Basically, the problem is, um, I think the coders are doing, and this is reflected in previous literature as well, the coders and survey respondents do a pretty good job of telling what countries are more corrupt than other countries or less corrupt than other countries. Uh, or you could just say they have, they can sort out which countries are really corrupt and which countries are less corrupt. They have a much harder time figuring out even over 10 year periods, how that, how changes happen. They do, there is a signal there, but the signal is, is weaker and the signal of the bias in changes is, is stronger. So the bias, I think, on sort of cross-national or I should say cross-sectional um, uh, variation, the bias is actually pretty low, I think. Um, the bias in, in temporal change is much higher. So the, the idea of PCA is to filter that out by using a large number of measures which have a common indicator. We also did PCA with those um, five to 10 year average um, panel scores and it was similar to what we saw with just the, the annual panel adjusted that the, the correlation kind of splits into these two dimensions. Um, and that second dimension is capturing something um, that we don't really know what exactly it is or how it's related to corruption, so. If I had to guess, it's it's either some kind of uh, um, something people think is corruption but isn't, or uh, it could also be that there are different aspects of corruption, like grand and petty corruption, and um, the scores load may load sort of differently on those two dimensions. And so it's sort of picking up overall corruption, but then also picking up the secondary dimension of specifically petty corruption. It could be that as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I think PCA is sensitive to variance. So if you have one variable that has a lot of variance to it, you can selectively pick that, pick that variable. Yeah, so we do standardize them. Um, we re um, do all of them to be zero to 100 because for those that aren't familiar, some of the scores go from like negative six to six or zero to 100 or like you mentioned zero to 18. Um, so we rescaled all of those from zero to 100. I don't I think that was about what we do with the uh, It's also the case, I know in the simulations, because um, I literally did them quite recently, that um, before PCA is, uh, before basically a singular value decomposition is, is attempted, the data are scaled and centered. So they're scaled to have unit variance and, and center zero. Um, it's been a while since I did that 
on the real data. I'm pretty sure I did the same thing. Um, but we actually also, even before that, put all the variables on the same scale, which should take care of most of the scaling issues in PCA either way. Thank you. So the question was, how do you think the trends will change when including grand and petty corruption? Um, it depends. It, it obviously, it, any kind of research question depends on where you're looking at and what country, um, what area, what time period. But I think the trends could start to increase when you start to include those fine grained aspects of corruption. You might see an influx of um, corruption trends over time. At least that's my thought process. The the measures the the raw the measures that go in mm -hmm. tend to measure both yeah. and not necessarily to strongly distinguish between them. Um, and actually, uh, this is an advantage of a perception based measure as opposed to like something, you know, some kind of observation, pure observational or, or government statistic based measure, because uh, petty corruption um, is much more easily captured in some of those statistics than grand corruption, right? Um, most people, like for example, I'll give you a very common measure uh, that is not a perception-based measure of corruption. Have you been asked for a bribe for a government service to which you are entitled in the last year? That's a that's an ex called an experience-based measure. Um, Lots and lots of corruption, in fact, most of the important corruption, in my opinion, does not involve asking individual citizens for cash or for some kind of bribe, right? So when, um, let's just say hypothetically, uh, a country wants to get the World Cup in, it, in, its, in, its, uh, in its home, um, you, you don't, uh, you don't um, go to all the you know, citizens of other countries and start giving them bribes or something. Um, you're only bribing a small number of high officials. But if you ask how much corruption do you perceive there is in this government or in this organization, um, even people who haven't personally been asked for a bribe still often know about it, right? Because of reporting, because of the fact that it's impossible to keep these secrets for too long. Um, so the upshot is most of the measures mix those perception and experience and also some objective statistics sort of freely and therefore they kind of m m amalgamate together all of those things. Our model is not designed to separately identify them because it doesn't make uh, really the, the strong assumptions that I think would be required to do that. Um, it just says both petty and grand corrupt. It, what, basically what it would be in the, in the case of our simulation is, imagine those bias parameters weren't exactly bias parameters. What they were was just um, uh, adjacent dimensions to the main dimension, right? So they were correlated, but not quite the same. And what would happen in that case is our score would be better, um, but it would still mix together those two things. If we wanted to separate them, either we have to assume that petty and grand corruption are, are orthogonal, meaning they have completely different, uh, they're on completely different dimensions, which I don't think is true or we'd have to somehow incorporate an assumption about the structure of the relationship between questions and outcomes or between these two dimensions and, and the overall sort of overall corruption score. And that's, that is something um, we are definitely leaving for future research because to try to tackle that in this paper, uh, you know, we just need people to, to accept the conclusions we've come to now before we get them to go along with us on the rest of it. But they can be different. There are countries that have relatively low petty corruption and relatively high grand corruption and vice versa.
the question um, for those online was that does PCA um, include or take account of any kind of measurement bias type stuff? And the answer is yes. Um, so because in our simulation, we also include that latent bias um, variable. We're trying to simulate PCA methodology before we do the actual methodology. So we have the latent bias um, variable there, but then when we do PCA, that's um, variable is included. So that answers. I mean, what I would say is if, if what bias is, is a systematic feature that is not corruption, but reflects some kind of, again, systematic misrating of countries. Let's say, for example, that the coders are slightly racist. Um, that probably won't overwhelmingly determine their, their, and probably it's mostly unconscious anyway, right? But it may cause them subtly to rate some countries a little higher or a little lower than they really ought to be based on that. Or suppose that they're slightly biased towards certain institutions, right? They like you know, um, democracies more than non-democracies or something like that. So that's that kind of bias PCA can can purify because it will essentially say those features are not related to corruption. They are related to something else. There's some other dimension um, or they are noise. That's also perfectly fine if they're just complete noise. In either of those cases, PCA will essentially move that variance off the main dimension and onto one of the auxiliary dimensions. There may be some really complex form of bias that it can't get at. Um, I, I don't think I'm probably should just start riffing on that, but I'm sure there's some way you could set it up where it wouldn't work. But for the, the cases I think that are sort of most obvious, it should, and, and the simulation shows it, it works in that scenario. So bias would be maybe like a PCA4 dimension, some some other like noise captured dimension. Could be systematic, could be noise. And there does seem to be something systematic in the second dimension of, of the within country, but I actually tend to believe that's probably not bias. I think that's probably another definition of corruption or another sort of take on corruption. Is this for the one on here? Yeah. Um, so there was an online question. So for PCA, do you think of the PCs as a latent variable of sorts? If so, given the loadings, can you label or give a meaningful concept to PC1 and, and 2? Or do you have an idea of what the results and loadings are telling you? Can you pop to that slide, the PCA? Yeah. So yes, this we one. do think of the PC um, columns or factor loadings as latent concepts. So because we are looking at corruption measures, we make the assumption, the strong assumption and very likely assumption that PC1 in both cases is corruption, um, a kind of across the board conceptualization of that variable. But PC2 um, and other PC dimensions, as we kind of mentioned, bias may be looking at, um, could be something unrelated to corruption, is probably something related to corruption though. It could be stuff that may not be captured in corruption as a definition, the um, abuse of public office for private gain. PC2 could be petty corruption, grand corruption, um, bribery, uh, overturned elections, some other type of conceptualization of what corruption may be. Um, but we don't wanna give like labels to them necessarily because it could be capturing something that we don't know. We could label it grand um, corruption, but PC2 is instead petty corruption. Um, I feel very but confident. Yeah. I feel very confident saying that PC one is overall corruption, yeah. and I feel confident saying that because first of all, all the measures load as you would expect. Right. Positively, and, and secondly, I mean, these measures are created by people who are trying to capture the pervasiveness of abuse of public office for private gain in, in the country. So I assume they're picking up something uh, in common, and so for those two reasons. Unlike an or so normally with PCA, you always are in a little bit of a guessing game with what the dimensions mean. I feel very confident in saying PC1 is corruption because we've got five measures of corruption. They all pretty much share the same definition of corruption. They all load pretty much as expected. It's probably that's probably what it is. The interesting thing too to, to at least point out and related to this question is if we look at the ICRG, if you remember from when I was talking about it. That one incorporates more political risk of corruption 
rather than the same exact definition as all the other scores. While it still loads positively and similarly on most dimensions, we do see that it is a little bit different than all the other measures. So if that, if that kind of helps explain the PC loadings a little bit better. The TICPI is also weaker, probably because before 2012, mm -hmm. the methodology was not really designed to allow inter-year comparisons. After that, they modified the methodology so that it did. So I'm guessing that, you know, some of that earlier stuff is, is just not as great. And for maybe one or one more or two more. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, okay, so the difference between those two is whether between, but essentially, the short way of putting it is if you take out between country variants, that's what's left. It's, we also take out global trends, but that's not as important. Um, I, it's still corruption. What it is, is it's corruption changes within a country, right? So once, for example, you take out all the things that make the United States systematically different from Zimbabwe, and then you're just comparing them to each other over time, there's still changes in corruption in those two countries over time. But the R squared is much lower because I think these, well, this is sort of what our simulation also illustrates. They're just, if the bias is sort of more influential on the trends than it is on the levels, you see it's still getting it, but it's getting it much more noisily. And so that's why the, the second step um, of also, once you panel correct, you also have to pull out the common dimension. That's why that's important, because if you just panel corrected, there'd still be, they'd be basically pretty weak measures. Um, I have another graph, which is not in here, but the, the difference between uh, in our simulation when you just use panel corrected measures and then you also purify them with PCA, it increases the correlation by roughly 0.2, which is a lot in terms of um, uh, reducing noise and increasing explained variance. Um, so to answer your question, I do think they're both, these are both corruption. It's just that it's much harder. These measures are much worse at measuring within country trends. Uh, we, we show that, and I, I just want to take this opportunity to highlight um, that that's a, this is a problem that everybody knew about in like the early 2000s. Everyone was talking about how intertemporal comparisons were not great, but most of these measures were developed as a purported solution to it. So the TI updated its methodology, the WBGI explicitly says you can compare across years, their UCM is designed to do that. The BCI, again, is explicitly designed to allow those kind of comparisons. And um, so uh, I guess we're here to say they still don't work, but there is something you can do about it that's not terrible.
Yes, that's, I would say as a general rule, that's probably true unless your measures are excellent. I am going to chill for a symposium uh, that I am running, but I'm not actually contributing to. I'm just the, the ringmaster. Um, it's about the measurement of democratic backsliding. Mm. Exactly the same kind of problems. Uh, there was a recent paper, uh, which, well, we conditionally accepted it. So it's, I did just like some minor revisions, but it will be published in PS by Meng and Little. Um, where they make the claim, actually, all these places that say there's democratic backsliding, there really isn't. And then we have all these other people who come in and say, here, they're wrong, and here's why, or here, they're right, and here's why. Or um, actually, this whole enterprise is wrong. <laughs> do this thing I want you to do. Um, so that, and so there's there's going to be a, uh, a special issue in PS and then an associated symposium in uh, at APSA in LA. And I am hoping that I mean, I know because I've read most of the papers that they're going to engage that question in that context. And in in our context, well, do you want to? In the context of democratic backsliding, right? So trying to measure whether democracies are actually becoming more autocratic around the world. Um, and that, that, so it's a, it's a different DV, but it's the same kind of problem or different related. There are related problems. In the corruption context, basically what we have done is we have, we have assumed that everybody's on to something. Nobody has a, like, well, there, I'm sure there's some trash measure out there, but none of these are really trash measures. But they also, for the reasons you already stated, they're trying to measure a relatively subtle phenomenon that's pretty easily influenced by various sources of bias. And so um, that actually methodologically is a, that's good news. Cause if I've got like five noisy measures, I can probably extract the common signal pretty easily. Cause that's a problem that goes back to like the forties. Um, that's, that's basically, if you asked me, what, where should you go? That's where you should go. And even other things before this project that I did, like if I was studying corruption in a time series cross-section basis, which I have, uh, I just do the estimate on all the measures I could get and then just show you here's the sort of diversity of results you get. And there's a central tendency, but there is some noise. And you know, then there's usually one weird one that tells you something insane. And then most of the rest of them are sort of together. And you just, I just present that and say, well, that's the best we can do. And hopefully this will allow you to do a little better because you can pre-filter some of that stuff. Somebody could take the Bayesian course of ICPM and they would learn really optimal ways of combining the information This is this is now a uh, this is a platform for me to shill for all the things I do. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, take my Bayesian course and you can learn, or actually uh, the, the Bayesian two course with um, uh, Mark Ratkovic, and you can learn how to, and actually the BCI is essentially, that's what they're doing. They're using Bayesian methods to try to. They're using like a Gibbs algorithm. Yeah, yeah. To, the Gibbs sampler to, to basically filter, well, yeah. They're trying to filter out noise. Um, so we, we have to let you go. I wanna just say if you, we are trying, we're gonna send this out soon, a couple of weeks maybe, mm -hmm. and we are debating where to send it. And if you have, you know, you've seen the, you've seen the, the, the sizzle reel, so if you think you know where this belongs, we would love to hear your thoughts on that. Do you have any, uh, any last any last words? No, I mean, thank you guys for listening. So this is the first big big talk I've done since being a grad student. So I appreciate the, the kind faces in the crowd. So thank you.